Hello, Malcolm speaking. If you're on my channel, it's probably because you like detail. You want to get things right. Now, if you want to skim through the photographs and get straight through to the nitty gritty, go to the chapter on this video that I call the nitty gritty. Enjoy. This video is the story of the first Mark 9s. In early 1941, Rolls-Royce put forward to Supermarine a proposal to fit a new variant of the Merlin engine into the Spitfire in order to keep pace with the performance of Germany's premier fighter, the Messerschmitt 109F. This was the Merlin 60 series that was being specifically developed for a high-altitude version of the Vickers Wellington bomber. In turn, the British Air Ministry accepted the Merlin 60 proposal and its use was anticipated to be in the future Mark 7 and Mark 8 Spitfires. However, at that time much design work was still needed on a stronger fuselage in order to cope with the extra power of the Merlin 60. By September 1941, a new German fighter had emerged that threatened to alter the balance of air superiority over Europe. This was the Focke-Wulf 190, which very quickly displayed superior speed and greater maneuverability, except in the turning circle, compared to Britain's best then fighter, the Spitfire Mark V. Having wrestled air superiority from the Spitfire, the Germans set about changing their defensive tactics to those of aggression. This had a profound effect on fighter command as their loss rate soared so much that by mid-November 1941 only absolutely essential operations were being flown across the channel. Meanwhile, the Air Ministry had been encouraged with the performance trials of the former Mark III Spitfire prototype N3297 now fitted with a Merlin 60 engine. This aircraft had made its first flight in the new configuration on the 27th of September 1941. However, more progress was required to get the Merlin 60 powered Spitfire into production in order to meet the new threat from the Focke Wulf 190. Between December 1941 and February 1942, the Air Ministry ordered six Mark V airframes for conversion to Merlin 60 and 61 configuration in order to speed up development of an interim variant of the Spitfire, the Mark 9. By April 1942, the Air Ministry had followed up with an order to Supermarine that it required 100 Merlin 61 Spitfire Mark 9s by the end of June all to be converted from Mark 5C airframes. The Merlin 61 engine that was to be fitted to the Mark 9 was approximately 9 inches longer than the Merlin 45 being fitted to the Mark 5. The extra length had come about because of a two-stage, two-speed supercharger arrangement separated by an intercooler at the rear of the Merlin 61 engine. Externally, a new, longer cowling had to be fabricated. To bring the Mark 9 into production quickly, it was decided that both Rolls-Royce at its Hucknall facility and Supermarine at its Eastleigh and Chartres Hill factories would fit the new engines to Mark 5 airframes as engines became available. Thus began one of the small quirks in Spitfire Mark 9 production, as the very first airframes began to emerge from the Rolls-Royce Hucknall factory, sporting a somewhat makeshift appearance. While Supermarine was tasked with fabricating a new cowling arrangement for production Mark 9s, Rolls-Royce, in the interim, had to improvise by simply modifying and extending existing Mark 5 panels. Accordingly, the first 83 Mark 5 to Mark 9 conversions produced at the Hucknall factory appeared with cowling extension panels and two notable blisters on top of the cowling. These blisters covered part of the overhead framework separating the cowling from the aft end of the Merlin's rocker covers. It is believed these earlier conversions and initial production Mark 9s both had a tighter cowling arrangement than the later examples produced at the Castle Bromwich factory of Vickers Armstrong. Supermarine converted only six Mark V airframes to Mark IX standard before settling on a production standard for new-build Mark IX airframes. 
Their conversions differed from the 83 by Rolls-Royce in that they featured a normal one-piece top cowling. The side and lower cowlings of the early Supermarine-built aircraft were formed from two new panels each, as distinct from the Rolls-Royce conversions, which used Mark V panels plus extensions. Here we have a crudely modified Mark V to Mark IX conversion from Rolls-Royce Hucknall factory. It shows the crude oil filter access panel. It shows the bulges added to the top of the cowling. It shows the crudely extended Mark V cowling. And it shows the extra vertical panel line evident from the Mark V cowling extension. You've probably watched my videos because you like detail. Well, here comes an overdose. This photo of a Rolls-Royce Hucknall factory Mark V to Mark IX conversion shows a number of salient features which resulted in external cowling differences. Here is an additional cowling support frame. Note that the first few Supermarine conversions had an extra panel line following the lower section of this frame. The intercooler introduced with the two-speed, two-stage supercharged Merlin 60 series and the associated bulkhead mounted glycol header tank. The new lower cowling panel, which replaced the Mark V's oil tank and forward under nose panel. The Mark V's oil tank was surface mounted and formed part of the lower nose contour. The crude kinked panel resulted from the adaption of the original Mark V cowling to the longer Mark IX nose. On this starboard side scrap view, I've highlighted the bulged panel over the Mark IX's extra cowling support frame, along with the prominent intake compressor scoop on that bulge. Here, <clears throat> here I'm highlighting a teardrop blister on the starboard engine cowling, similar to the blister on Mark II's associated with that version's Kaufman cart cartridge starter system. The two-stage 60 series Merlins of the Mark IX all had electric starting and the blister reflects the provision on some Merlin variants for a drive shaft intended to drive the cockpit pressurization compressor in the Mark VII. Although the compressor was only used in the high altitude Mark VII, the Merlin 61, 63A and 64 of the early Mark IX were provided with the drive housing and therefore needed the blister. Later examples of the Mark IX built with Merlin 63, 66 or 70 engines did not require this blister because the drive housing had been deleted from those versions. This change appears to have taken place around the end of 1942 or early 1943 so that machines in the BR, BS and EN serial ranges had the blister while later machines did not. This is BR143, one of the very first Rolls-Royce conversions to the Mark IX standard. It was sent to the Rolls-Royce Hucknall assembly shop in April 1942 for the new Merlin 61 engine to be fitted. Now I've highlighted here the ID light on the fuselage spine after the radio mast. This was deleted during Mark IX production and it is not seen from the MA serial range onward. This is the port side of a Mark V cowling where I've highlighted two small blisters. Now these residual blisters appeared on some early Mark IX cowlings. This is a port side view of a Supermarine Eastley factory Mark V to Mark IX conversion for example BR592. It shows the extra vertical panel line just behind the exhaust stacks and the residual Mark V cowling blisters on the upper cowling panel. This port side plan shows a Supermarine EN serial range Spitfire Mark IX with a more refined upper cowling. And two other points to note. Uh, the ID light on the fuselage spine after the radio mast typical of EN range early Mark 9s. And secondly, the early Mark 9s had the Mark 5 type identify friend or foe wire antenna stretching from both sides of the fuselage to the tips of the tailplane. 
On the port side here you can see it highlighted just below the radio hatch. From early 1943 a new style of antenna was introduced in the form of a small pole under the starboard wing just forward of the aileron. The isolator grommet and fuselage exit hole for the earlier style antenna remained in Spitfires produced long after it was no longer required. This is squadron leader Colin Gray standing beside his Spitfire EN520. Uh, Gray was posted to the Middle East and took command of 81 Squadron on the 24th of January 1943. He ended the war as New Zealand's highest scoring fighter ace. This machine was upgraded to Mark 9 standard by Rolls-Royce and first flew as a Mark 9 on the 11th of February 1943. Note the rectangular Mark 5 style mirror repositioned inside the cockpit. Now this is another EN series Spitfire Mark 9. It's EN 568. The aircraft flown by Group Captain Alan Deere in the uh, summer of 1943. In common with all Spitfires manufactured before about May 1943, early Mark 9s had the original Mark 1 style elevator with smaller horn balance. The change to the, the later design with a large horn balance appears to have occurred during the MA series. And here we have an MA series Spitfire Mark 9. This is Sergeant Pilot Wally Marr, RNZAF, standing in front of MA 807 in March 1944. Jimmy McLean, also of the RNZAF, is standing on the wing. Now, MA 807 has a number of interesting features, and I will go over them one at a time. First, in the root of the starboard wing, you can see the gun camera port. Um, you can see the air intake, which is to a larger cross-section than that of the, uh, of the previous Mark Vs. They are significantly bigger, although it's not always perceived to be all that much bigger. And finally, there is the fuel cooler intake. The fuel cooler was beneficial in situations where the fuel tended to boil under rapid climb conditions. The fuel cooler was not fitted to Spitfire Mark 9s with later Merlin 66 or 70s engines, as these featured an improved carburetor which overcame the fuel boiling problem. And that completes our story about the early production Spitfire Mark 9s. Originally, this material was published in Classic Warbirds No. 6, which is many years out of print. So uh, I think. Putting up these videos on YouTube is one way of getting this information back out there into the public space. Please hit the like and subscribe buttons as that helps me build this channel. Also, if you're of a mind to, please buy me a coffee. It all helps. Thank you. Last but not least, here are a couple of video suggestions that you may want to take a look at next.